What is up, everybody? Welcome into Tuck Rule Takes, episode 87, the the greatest tight end in Patriots history, Liam. Say it. Ben Coates. The Ben Coates episode. (laughs) Fuck yeah. Episode. Anyone but Gronk. Fuck that. Uh, (laughs) Even though off air, you were just like, oh, I should have worn my Gronk jersey for this episode. I don't have a Ben Coates jersey. It would look (laughs) way cooler. So obviously that's Liam. I'm Al. <laughs> uh, no mic this week. This is a first for Taco Takes. I think this is the first mm. episode in yeah. Taco Takes history. Can you confirm that? Uncharted weird? waters. It is absolutely. So no mic this week. He's going through some some personal stuff. It would feel disingenuous to kind of say what's going on when he comes back on next week. We'll let him kind of say what was going on if he so chooses. But just no mic. We miss you. We love you. And we obviously want you to be on this episode, but we understand why you couldn't be. And for all of our fans out there, Mike's good. Everything's good. You know, just sometimes life gets in the way and sometimes yeah. you got to take care of your family. He's just really, really old. Yeah. So he, he is. He, he's got the, you know, he's got the, I don't know if you'll understand this reference to him. He's got the Fred Lynn knees. The Freddie no. Lynn knees. Fred Lynn played for the Red Sox and he's got two bad knees. He had to get surgery in both knees. He literally says to himself, I have two new knees, literally. Damn. Poor fucking guy. That must be brutal. I know. So there's a lot we still got to talk about, though, right, Liam? A lot that went on in the land of uh, our New England Patriots. It's a juicy week. It is a juicy week. So let's let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into it. We'll open it up with the big story that kind of hit Friday afternoon. Patriots corner Jack Jones arrested for having two loaded guns in his duffel bag at Logan Airport. He was arrested Friday afternoon. He was released on $30,000 bail. He was arraigned in East Boston District Court on Tuesday morning. He will have, excuse me, he will have another court date on August 18th. And just kind of an opening take with this, Liam. And then obviously I want to hear your thoughts on this too. But I mean, Jack Jones, it was a, it was a mistake. It was, it was a big, Oh, oh, of course, big mistake. He certainly didn't intend to go on an airplane strapped up. No, but at the same time, like, how dumb can you be? A hundred percent. Like, how dumb can you be? Now, Liam, let me ask you something. You're a man of culture. You're a man that likes to travel, right? I fancy myself that. What do you do when you're at the airport? What are things you check for in your bag to make sure that maybe you don't have or you do have? And I'm not talking about the guns that were in Jack Jones' bag. I'm just talking common man Oh, he made sure he had those. Uh, You know, I look for the essentials. If I'm bringing my laptop, uh, I make sure I have my contacts, my glasses, my phone charger, because we're all fucking addicted to technology. Uh, The proper amount of underwear and whatnot. The essentials, the stuff that I probably can't buy in the destination that I'm going. Right. And and other things, too. You'll check, like, your shampoo to make sure that you have the right travel size. Maybe, like, your deodorant, you know, stuff like that. I bathe in lakes, but yeah. Yeah, you bathe in lakes. You know, you're like the dude in Happy Gilmore that's just washing himself (laughs) in a lake. Yeah. (laughs) But but with that, you would probably check your bag. And if it was a little heavy, you'd probably be like, huh, I wonder what could be in there. Or you hear the click, click, click rattling around in your bag as you're walking. Yeah, and then if you looked in, you might be like, oh, shoot, I have something <laughs> in my bag. No pun intended. We, no pun we've intended. We've all been there. We've all been where we started walking into the airport, realized we had our guns on us, had to go back, drop the guns off, show up to the airport, not fully armed. I Right, but I just don't understand. I truthfully don't understand what the thinking was for Jack Jones behind this just encounter at Logan Airport. This was right after OTAs were over. And then you decide to pull this. Like, there's probably, like, five things they tell you not to do. And knowing Belichick, there's probably, like, 12 of them. But still, they're all probably reasonable. And you do one of the things that you're not supposed to do. And now, not only that, Liam, here's the problem. Jack Jones is looking at, at the worst, two and a half years in prison. Yeah. Or, sorry, no, not two. Sorry, not two and a half. At least a year and a half. Is it a year and a half? I thought it was between two and 20. It, so I think I saw it was like 18 months, and then I think – in don't quote me on this next detail, but I think if he didn't have the guns registered or didn't have a license to carry, yeah. then I think that adds on to it, and I think that's the two yeah, and a half yeah, to three. Yeah. But the point is, right, he's facing jail time. Yeah. I don't know uh, if you saw, I don't know if you saw Liam. Did you see his lawyer come out today? Yeah. Yeah, she's, she's kind of weird looking, but apparently she's <laughs> one of the best in Boston. I mean, she she came out and was like, "Oh, you know, the media is coming out and saying that um, 
that Jack Jones is a thug. Jack Jones is like, you know, a gang member and stuff. I don't recall people saying that. No, people are taking liberties, but she's she's playing it up. because She has to portray her right defendant as the victim. So she's trying to create reasonable doubt. It's literally the lawyer's job. But she, people are giving her an inch and she's taking a mile with that accusation. People are just fixated on the Panda Express incident and some of his other questionable habits. The things we talked about when he was drafted. Mm-hmm. But I, I certainly wouldn't jump to con- the conclusion of him being a thug because he broke into a fast food Chinese restaurant in college either. Right. It, right. People have done so much worse. And, yeah. and the, the thing is, again, you hope the best for Jack Jones, right? You hope he learns from this. You hope yep. he gets a second chance at life. Doesn't and, go to jail for 20 years. I mean, that would be, that'd be ideal. And even like if he gets a short jail sentence, still, when he gets out, you hope that he becomes, you know, a functioning member of society and he yeah. contributes to, to society if and when he gets out. But again, you put the Patriots in such a bad position now. And we're going to talk about this because this is going to kind of relate to some other topics. The, the one question about this, Liam, that I want to ask you, if you're the Patriots, do you cut Jack Jones or do you hang on to him until he has his trial? Me being, you know, having no stake in the game, not having any part of the organization, probably being a little too compassionate, I wouldn't. But, I, you know, if I had to make a bet as the Patriots, I'm surprised he's still on the team right now. Like, this is one of those things where you kind of cut bait in the moment. You brought weapons to the airport. That is bottom line. You're kind of fucked. Like, that was an awful mistake. Short of killing somebody in, like, a motor vehicle accident, even if it's an accident when you – accidental manslaughter – you still did it. It's a terrible mistake. This is the worst mistake I can think of that didn't end somebody's life uh, since Alden Smith yelled bomb in an airport, the old 49ers outside linebacker. I, I actually know didn't know it. that. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, he, he yelled bomb in an airport, and, I, and the 49ers cut him like that. But he had, had, unlike Jack Jones, he had been in a lot of trouble beforehand, had right. an even more suspect history. But it's one of those things where it's like, man, like, Really dumb mistake. Really, really dumb. And for that, you're probably going to get cut because you were so negligent. So I think they're going to cut him. I would be a little more sympathetic, but I think the Patriots will cut him. See, I think the I was clear cut earlier thinking the Patriots are going to cut him too. But yeah. now, but at the same time, when you think about it, if this trial takes place for like the whole calendar year, like the rest of 2023 into 2024, without any like consequence to happen yet yeah. to say Bill Belichick won't be like, you know what? <laughs> we I, can get him for a year. <laughs> we can get him for one more year and then we'll cut him. And then he's going, probably going to jail anyway. So, but he's again, not going to another team. So he can't hurt us. Right. Like it's, it's terrible. To, it's terrible <laughs> to think about. It's it awful is. to think about. It's, it's totally so bad. It is. But, but unfortunately that's not out of the realm of possibilities. No. And that's that's the crazy thing here. Now, Jeff Howe said on Toucher and Rich this morning that he thinks that the Patriots are going to cut Jack Jones as well. The organization is rightfully livid, and they should be. They should be. Mm-hmm. They should be pissed about this. Yeah, it's fucking stupid. It's very stupid. And now to kind of transition, did you have any final thoughts about just the actual situation before we kind of go into some different topics that still relate to Jack Jones? Yeah, I I heard the defense for his lawyer's defense, or at least the main part of it. I'm sure there's multiple different angles of it. But she just claimed negligence and claimed that he had no idea that they were in his bag. And when I hear that, I'm like, how good of a defense is that? It's it's a horrible, it's a horrible defense. I know. But all you need to do to win a case is to prove reasonable doubt. Like a reasonable person has to have a little bit of doubt that, any you know he really intended to commit this crime or he had any harmful you know malice in this act but i so i heard it and i'm like can they win like that like i'm trying to think and i i I don't know it just seemed like an interesting point to me i don't know if she has much of a case there but it was kind of cool here in the defense and i'm like can she poke holes in that i guess we'll see maybe but i just i don't think it's a great defense and the thing Mm -hmm. that she said today that got me was like social media and you guys being like the the sports media and just overall news media is making him out to be this way. 
I was looking at Twitter the day that it happened, Liam, and the the Big J reporters, like the Mark Daniels and the Jeff Howes and like all the football writers, yeah. they were just saying what the incident was. Yes, yeah. That's all it was. They were just reporting the facts. So if you're yeah. reporting the facts, how is it that you're portraying Jack Jones in a negative light? He's already done that by committing the crime. Yeah. But if you're going to commit the crime, you're already going to put yourself into that situation. And she also said, oh, Mr. Jones was also almost fired. He just wants to go back to playing football. Okay, if he wants to play football, why do you not take the five seconds to think, hmm, this seems very odd. Let me just double check this. At least if you check it, then you can be like, hey, I don't know how these got in there. They got in there. I'm taking them out and I'm, and I will put them away. Like I don't want them or anything like that. At least be, yeah. you know, a little bit more, you know, Proactive. just mindful of the situation. Yeah. It, the whole thing, like I said, it's negligent. It's it's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. Just completely preposterous that he would do something so dumb. I don't know. It's disappointing because he was going to be one of the jerseys that I was going to be buying for this upcoming season. I was hoping I could sell my Juju jersey for a third of the price when he has his first catch and then try and get a Jack Jones jersey. Oh, okay. I don't know. The whole the whole thing's the whole thing's so ridiculous, though. What was that uh, Adam Schefter tweet? Was it about Dwayne Haskins? Remember, he, he got in trouble. A tweet that he had because he referenced the person's p- past instead it, it of just be- saying what happened, he said what happened and then said something about yeah. Their past. It was I remember was it that Dwayne t- Haskins. It was Dwayne. It was it was because he had just passed away. Yeah. I, th- I think it was because he just passed away, and they said uh like bust or something like that. It yeah, was something along the line. failed journeyman quarterback. Yeah, something, something, something like, like that. that. And then everyone got all over him and it's like, yeah. like and I can ever understand. since that people just say exactly what happened. So when you brought up that Jack Jones, like all the reports from the big Adam Schefter, especially after that, is yeah. only going to tell you what happened. And he won't tell you any background or any opinion based thing. Exactly. And you know what? So let, let's transition for a sec. So mm. we're going to stay on Jack Jones, right? But yeah. now let's take a look at the defense for a second. So now let's just say, right, Liam, let's just say they do the, the logical thing and they cut Jack Jones. So now your corners are looking like Christian Gonzalez on one side, probably Jonathan Jones on the other side because he's going to move from the slot to the outside. Yeah. And then maybe you put or, or you can put Marcus Jones on the outside and keep John Jones in the slot corner position. Because I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to see Miles Bryant on the field for an extended no, period of time. No, 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 absolutely not. He had his one play in Buffalo in that, that yeah. horrible. If we're playing the Bills, I'll think about it, but I'm still Maybe. not super hyped. And, and it's got to be like snowing, like a snowstorm. Yeah. It's got to be hailing out. Then maybe you consider him. But otherwise, yeah. I'm not saying that it it thins the, the, the corner room, but it does make it a little smaller for error. Like you, you can't have – any like extensive injuries you can't really have anything unless if you want to go two corners and maybe go like a couple like another safety or something like that because the Patriots have a surplus of safeties especially with Jabril Peppers and Adrian Phillips Jalen Mills can obviously play safety (laughs) right it's all safeties so that's where and I think truthfully Liam and I and I do want to hear your opinion on this in a second this is where Christian Gonzalez now has more pressure on him right because now he was a first round pick he was a guy that was supposed to come in, and he's he's going to make a difference. But now in week one, does Bill Belichick say to him, "Hey, guess what? You got AJ Brown. Like you're not yeah. gonna t- you're not gonna take who's the number two receiver in Philly? Devontae Smith, baby. Oh, I forgot about Devontae Smith. That's right. Beast. So, so Devontae, so Devontae Smith. So, so no, you're not gonna cover Devontae Smith today. You're gonna cover AJ Brown. Yeah. And in week two. You're gonna cover Jalen. You're gonna cover Tyree Kill. You're not covering Jalen Waddle. Although Tyree Kill, did you hear about Tyree Kill real quick? Uh, no, maybe. Uh, supposedly he was on a, a fishing trip in Miami. He hit some somebody in the back of the head, and now there's like a serious. There's something going on with that. <laughs> I'm not surprised. This guy's a fucking idiot. But no uh, way. Yeah. Ty, Tyree Kill's a moron. But but anyways, the so point wait, being, like, is the person? Like dead or suing him or no no I I don't think they're I don't think they're pressing charges but I think they're just looking into the situation but yeah. anyways getting back to Christian Gonzalez yeah. now there's more pressure on him Liam and you need to make sure now maybe not maybe not pressure but there's definitely like that urgency that like yeah you need to make sure that you're ready it's, it's his position one. is thinner and you're right about that like there is one less guy that we thought was going to have a pretty big contribution to the team. Um, I don't like to be cynical, 
but I always kind of had the impression that, and not even because of his background stuff, like that Jack Jones just could have been gone at any moment. He was suspended at the end of last season. Right. He had a few games where he rode the pine because he wasn't exactly doing what Bill wanted to. Mm-hmm. And then once you add in in college and his before the NFL troubles, it doesn't paint a great picture, but literally his one sample size in the league, it's like the highest of highs picking off Aaron Rodgers and then having a pick in the next game against the lions. And then just, going non-existent toward the end of the season where Marcus Jones blows up and Jack Jones is suspended. So I always kind of in the back of my mind, I was like, there's a chance that we just cut him because he's too much trouble. And Bill doesn't want to deal with the fact that he won't work out with the team or he won't do the little things with the team. So I kind of always had that impression. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel that way? Or were you just like, yeah, he'll figure it out. I was, I was, I think hopeful that he would figure it out. Now I forgot about the Panda Express incident in college. But I knew, <laughs> I knew there were I knew there were character issues with him, and I knew that there was a dispute at the end of the season with his injury and and how to how to yeah. manage that and everything. So I knew there were some discrepancies a little bit, but I didn't think it was going to come to this extreme where we're looking at a, a court case, a, a trial. Like I did not think it was going to come to this. Yeah, and, like if you're a superstar or a veteran player, maybe I'd understand it. You've been on other teams, you've been around the league, or if you're like Christian McCaffrey where you're a superstar, like you probably like your own routine. I know he goes out to Hawaii and trains all the time, but literally in your rookie year, you can't rehab with the team. It's like that's not a good sign. Like you have no experience in the league and you're making these kind of decisions. So I had a bad taste in my mouth. Yeah, and and honestly, the Jack Jones situation, it's not directly – the same as like the Aaron Hernandez situation, but when a big legal issue was going on, and I know that again, different circumstances, but look what happened when Aaron Hernandez, when Aaron Hernandez's stuff was coming out, right. They cut ties right away. Like yeah. it was like, he got arrested. And then an hour later he got boom. Cut. Like, Oh, cut. of course. Now yeah. if I'm Robert Kraft, I don't want negative headlines for the Patriots consuming, you know, the airwaves and everything similar. You don't want, the late 1990s Patriots at the end of the Pete Carroll era, where it seemed like one out of every like four or five headlines, it's something bad or something yeah. detrimental or That's whatever. That's the way else. we roll. Everything's in house. We don't want any media attention. We don't want anyone talking about us. When we had won or been to three straight Super Bowls, we wanted no media attention. And right. it's like now that we're kind of an afterthought, especially in our division and in the league as in general. We're exactly where Bill wants us to. Where no one's talking about the Patriots. No one really cares about the Patriots. And that's perfect. He doesn't want the media attention. And then, sure enough, this dude brings two friggin' hand cannons to the airport. It's like, so I don't know. I, I expect him to be gone. Like, I'm surprised he's still on the team right now. Uh, as for your Christian Gonzalez point, where it puts more pressure on him, mm-hmm. do you think that's too much to ask on a rookie. I don't think Bill would do that personally, where he's like, you got AJ Brown. And then next week you got Tyree kill. And then the week after that, you got Stefan Diggs. Like I can't imagine that's how the Patriots roll where he's going to treat Gonzo like Stefan Diggs, where he's like, just right. lock him up the whole game. In my eyes, the Patriots are going to have their 18 safeties back there. And they're all going to be playing wild zone and zone blitzes and man, and it's going to be a huge thing where they kind of integrate him. And then, you know, in two years, if Gonzo develops as we hope he would, then it's like, all right, you're going to be man to man the entire game. Everyone else is going to be playing zone. Don't pay attention to what the rest of the defense is doing. But when you say it puts extra pressure on him early, I don't think Bill's like that. You got to be realistic with, with your guys, too. Like, he's a rookie. So I, so I don't think. To, you know, say you're a stud. Everyone your whole life has told you that you're the best football player. You get to the league, and then Bill Belichick's like, go cover A.J. Brown. Like, I don't care if everyone told you you're the next LeBron James. Like, that's a tough ask. It is. It is. And I think if Jack Jones was still in the offense, or sorry, in the in the defense, I, I don't think that he gets asked that. No, I think you're right, and I think there's some merit to that. But now but- you think it's out of necessity. I think it could very well be out of necessity. It, and it all depends too, because if AJ Brown or Tyree Kill or whoever, like, you know, yes, I, I like the game plan of if they beat Gonzalez on a route and you have the safeties back there, I like that. 
Yeah. But if you can stop, if you can stop the receivers at the line of scrimmage, you can stop them, you know, mid route or whatever it is. And that's because of Christian Gonzalez, then great. He's going to have a big part of the defense this year, no matter what he's going to be yeah. in. The, he's going to be playing 100%. a lot. He'll be playing, I think at least 65 to 70% of the snaps. I really do. At, at the year after the Seahawks, who were Malcolm Butler played like 70% of the snaps, like exactly. 90% of the snaps. And he's, I wouldn't even put him in the caliber that Gonzo is now, and I haven't seen him play a snap. Like, I would just expect Gonzalez to be more talented, probably a better player than Malcolm Butler. I did too. Butler, Butler got a ton of snaps. So I, I think that's just the way that they're going to roll with their number one corners at always. Mm-hmm. And I think I think training camp is going to be a big indicator of that, right? Like, if he's lighting it up in training camp, like he's reading routes well, he's reading Max eyes and Bailey Zappi's eyes and Trace McSorley – and he's, you know, picking the ball off and he's, yeah. you know, deflecting passes and everything, then maybe Belichick has more confidence in him. But if he's a step too slow, if guys are getting good good jumps on him, especially if receivers get like a good step or two, like right off the right off the snap, then yeah. maybe yes, maybe you you dial it back a little bit and you say, All right, you know, you'll you'll get your playing time, you'll get to play, but also learn from guys like John Jones, learn from Marcus Jones, even learn from I can't believe I'm gonna say this, Miles Bryant. Like learn from learn from these guys, like yeah. understand what they're doing and pick the brains of the safeties too. Like you yeah. know, Duggar and 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 Phillips and Jabril Peppers, Peppers. Plays every yep. position in college. Just ask him. A bunch of Literally, yeah. just go to Jabril Peppers. That's your mentor. But yeah. yes, so the defense is going to be fine. I think it takes a little bit of a hit because I think Jack Jones was going to take a big step up this year for that defense. Yeah, and you you could have had Gonzo and Jack Jones on both sides with Marcus Jones integrating himself in there you would have had a little more depth but now it is what it is if you have to play more more safeties that's fine like the patriots have a strong safety like just safety group which is yeah. great but again we'll we'll keep up with the details as as they come out again jack jones going to be going back to court august 18th so we'll see what happens with that uh any final thoughts on jack jones before we kind of move into a different topic uh yeah more more so just the cornerback room in general mm-hmm. we talk about how many safeties the patriots have that's been a harping point this entire conversation here we also and it, it completely goes by the wayside to me anyway i like to thank you certainly not to mike that we have jalen mills and he can just yeah. go right back to being our starting corner like he has been the last two years do I love it? No, but he can. So he it can, is yes. so nice. Yeah, and that's a nice luxury to have. He's not Jack Jones. He's not as exciting. I had more faith in Jack Jones. But hell, if we have a veteran corner who's been in the league and who's won a Super Bowl and started on a Super Bowl team, eh, that'll that'll work for me. Right. And honestly, to that point, if you start with John Jones, Marcus Jones, and um John, uh, Jalen Mills. Thank you, Jalen Mills. If you, if you, <laughs> well, no, I was trying to think without Jalen Mills. I was trying to think like who oh, it would yeah. it be without Jalen Mills. But it, okay, so even Gonzo. If you have, oh, okay, there you go. So the two Joneses right now. About. I know. See, we're, see, <laughs> we're, we're throwing so, so many bad. names out here, but yeah. Christian Gonzalez, John Jones, and Marcus Jones. And then you kind of get Jalen Mills in there. He doesn't have to play all the snaps. He could no. play like just on third downs if you really want to, if you believe no. in his ability or something like that. Then you're keeping all your corners fresh. You can mix in some of those like two or three safety looks if you want to. So I so again, there can't be anything more. There can't be like a lingering injury. There can't be anything that goes on because if you lose another corner, then it's going to start to really get depleted because then Miles Bryant will have to come in. And I'm going to pull my hair out before the end of the season. And, and then we're fucked. Yeah. Then the season's over. We're winning s- six games. It's, yeah, yeah, exactly. We're, t- we're tanking for Caleb Williams. Maybe. I don't know. But anyways. Yeah. Yeah. And Jalen Mills does have a spotty injury history. So that is a mm-hmm. bit of a concern. Um, I was watching the, and then we'll move on to the next topic, but this, yeah, yeah. As, as a Patriots fan, like it tickles your fancy to hear this stuff. I was watching the mid season uh, HBO hard knocks of the Arizona Cardinals from this last season, mostly because I wanted to see Hopkins and Belichick yeah, you know, yeah. in the full full episode flirting. But hearing Cliff Kingsbury, who obviously used to be a quarterback for the Patriots, was drafted by the Patriots, thinks very highly of Bill Belichick, was a part of our system. Hearing him as an opposing head coach preparing for the Patriots, 
it's it's the most flattering thing in the world. It's oh, yeah. unbelievable. The dude is terrified. He is mortified of Bill Belichick. He goes, we have nothing to game plan for because the Patriots roll out a different game plan each week. On offense, we can't look at their defense from last week because last week they played the Bills and they are not going to attack us like they attacked the Bills. And they are going to take away our best strength. So he stands in front of the room and he goes, what's our best strength? And eight different players give eight different answers. And Cliff Kingsbury goes, yeah, this is going to be a long week. And it's just like so <laughs> flattering where he's like, I have no idea what, what Bill thinks our best strength is. And they're all trying to figure out what the Patriots are going to stop. And they all game plan for like Kyler Murray's scrambling ability. And then he goes down on third play and the whole game plans. Are oh, I know. I know. Oh man, that's why it was so King flattering not though. there anymore. It's great. Uh, and, but yeah. And then he moves to Tyler. He's living the life, but oh, and yeah. then he talks, <laughs> he talks about the safeties. He's like, they have like four safeties back there. They all do the same thing. He's talking about this crazy defense and this was all last year. So you think about it this year, it sucks that we don't have Jack Jones, but the way he described the Patriots, where it's just it's a different thing each week, where there's they'll do zone if they, you're bad at reading zone, and they will attack you and what you're worst at. I'm not too worried about it because Jack Jones is a small piece. Like if we right. lost, who, who's the most important player on it? Judon. I would say so, Matt Judon. Yeah, if we lost Judon, then I'm freaking out. You know, if we lost, Bar- we lost Barmore last year for like four games. It sucked. Wasn't the end of the world. In fact, we right. still got good pressure on the defensive line. So, really, like even if we lose Kyle Duggar, Jabril Peppers does the same thing. He's not as good, but he does the same thing. We got like two other. Marte Mapu can do the same thing now. I don't think one player leaving, getting hurt, you know, any excuse that they're not in the lineup really kills this Patriots defense momentum almost at all. It's disappointing as a fan because I want to see 13 have another pick six, mm-hmm. but it's a shame. We probably won't see it, but I'm not worried for this Patriots defense. No, I'm not either. I actually wrote an article on Chatter and Champions, shameless plug, that the the Patriots defense could be special this year. They really could yeah. be because they have a lot of talent. I think Christian Gonzalez and Keon White and Marte Mapu. And honestly, if one of these late round picks like Speed or um, Isaiah Bolden like ends up panning yeah. out, this can be end up being a really, really solid draft class that can add value to the defense, which would be great yeah. to see. But you mentioned his name just a moment ago, so I want to talk about this real quick. We we did a whole episode, last episode on him, DeAndre Hopkins. He took his visit with the Patriots well, uh, Wednesday night into Thursday late afternoon. No contract was signed, which we kind of expected, and we all kind of lost the uh, the bet of when he will sign. So Yep. Yeah, when Mike comes back, we'll we'll do that idea that you had. I like that. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll save that. That's a little teaser for next week. Unless yep. Hopkins signs, then we can't do it. But it is. Then we're fucked. But, and then we'll be happy. Yeah, exactly. It, we, there's there's some happiness. There, there's a light at the end of the tunnel either way. It's a contingency plan. Exactly. DeAndre Hopkins, not signed yet. And, and this was just the one question that I wanted to ask you, Liam. And we'll, we'll keep this to like two to five minutes. We, we won't yep. be too long with this. You know thing. The Patriots and the Titans supposedly, according to several sources, offer something unique to DeAndre Hopkins. So if I'm the Patriots, right, Let, let's think about this. We keep going back to what Hopkins said on the I Am Athlete podcast, right? Three yeah. things that he wants. You remember the three things he wanted? A quarterback that loves the game. Okay, Mac Jones, you got that. Check. Uh, I don't remember any of the other ones. Stable management. Belichick and Kraft is stable as they come. Check. Yep. Championship caliber defense. Okay, Patriots have one of the best defenses in the league. Check. Oh, and by the way, as a cherry on top of the Sunday, you have the cap space to bring him in. Check. Oh, by the, the most way, cap space. And, and if you want a little whipped cream on that Sunday too, by the way, Liam, on DeAndre Hopkins can be the number one receiver. He can be. I know we we kind of you know debated this last week, but he can be a big part of this offense. Check, 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 check. Yeah, he fits all the boxes. So, so here's my yeah. question to you. So, th- this is uh-huh. the question I wanted to ask. Why has a deal not been signed yet? What is the holdup? To having DeAndre Hopkins officially in a Patriots uniform. I have a small theory, and it's not that far-fetched, but I want to see what you think first. The only thing I could think of, the only way it really benefits him to hold out, because he's missing precious time to work with the team and get used to the team. I always defend Cam Newton because he came in late, didn't really get a full training camp, and was just thrown into a COVID Absolutely. 
I fear the same thing for DeAndre Hopkins. Like he should be practicing with the team. It's an infamously difficult playbook. I know Nikhil Harry sucked, but he had a hard time grasping the playbook, and a lot of players do. Reggie Wayne couldn't co- keep up with the physicality, physical demands, and the playbook of the Patriots. And he, he was like, I'm not going to do this in my 17th year. I'm going to retire. It's infamously tough, so I want to get him in here. The only benefit I can think of is he's hoping that you know, Gabe Davis go, goes down for the Bills and they, they work whatever magic they can to try and get him in there. Or Kadarius Tony always misses time for the Chiefs. Maybe he goes down. That's the only benefit I can think of is that he's holding out for like one of the clear cut contenders or for the Bengals to trade T. Higgins. Something crazy like that where he's like, all right, now, I mean, if you're a player, who doesn't want to play for the Chiefs? Come right on. on. Juju Smith Schuster won a Super Bowl as their number one. DeAndre Hopkins as their number one would be gross. So that's the only thing. It's just it's greed at that point. I get it. He's looking out for himself. It's a it's a pipe dream. It's a great vision. It's like, what if Randy Moss went and played with Tom Brady in his prime? Like fucking something like that, where it's like it sounds like the perfect matchup. So that's the only thing I can think of. Ding, 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 ding. You're correct. That's exactly what I was yeah. thinking too. We're on the same page because guess what? And and I recorded Legends Lingo earlier. It had Bobby Thompson of JSN Network on with us and he covers the yeah. Patriots and stuff too. And he brought up he brought up a really great point. If the Chiefs want to, they're, re- they're going to restructure their contract with Chris Jones yeah. and then they're going to, excuse me, and then that's going to free up a lot of count. Cal- uh, Salary cap space. So if that's the case, you don't think the Chiefs might call up DeAndre and be like, hey, listen, I know we didn't call right away, but now we got the money. You know, we can make this work. And you're coming to a Super Bowl team that won the Super Bowl last year, has won two of the last four. We got arguably the best quarterback in the NFL, arguably the best tight end in the NFL. So, I mean, what, what are we waiting for here? Yes, I do think that's on the table. And guess what? If Hopkins can put his pride aside, and I know we, I know you know we have our differences on the Bills. I think they are a good team. I know you don't think they're as good as advertised, which is understandable. Yep. But guess what? If the Bills called him and said, "Hey, you're going to be with Stephon Diggs. You're going to be with Josh Allen. You know, we're we're right on the cusp of you know making a deep playoff run. We got, we got almost all the pieces in place. If you're DeAndre Hopkins. You don't want to go there. And yep. if you can oh, put your pride aside, if you can put your pride aside, that's the big thing. If you can't then it wouldn't be a good fit because Stefan Diggs is there. And even Stefan Diggs is complaining about his role in the play calling and everything else, which is preposterous. Cause he gets the ball 14 times a game, but like that's like, I'll use, I always kind of, I grew up in the 2000s. So I always use that as my role model. Like why would Randy Moss want to play for the Ravens where they were running the ball with Jamal Lewis 30 times a game when he could go to the Patriots where they were running it with Lawrence Maroney, like 12 times and then throwing the rest of the way. Like, there are more avid passing teams than the Patriots and the Titans. And those are the only two that he's taken visits with seem to be the only two offering out contracts in him. Most receivers are uh, divas is the word that everyone likes to use. I, I would say selfish in a sense, because like they, they want to get the ball on every play. Yep. You know, it's a Terrell Owens mentality. I was open Jeff every fucking play. So it's like, yes, maybe I can win a Super Bowl with the Patriots, but maybe I could win it with the Chiefs and also get six catches a game. And it's like, I want to be a part of the offense. I want to be scoring a ton of touchdowns. Yes, he can score more meaningful touchdowns with the Patriots. But you can score more touchdowns with the Chiefs. Yep. Yep. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. And guess what? There's going to come a situation where in training camp, you're going to see I don't want to say a big name, but you'll see a significant name receiver potentially go down and a team like the Ravens. And I'm just throwing a couple random teams out there, like the Ravens, the lions, maybe like the jets or something. If they get a a receiver that goes down, they pick up the phone. They say, Deandre, what, what is it going to take to get here? And if he likes that situation better, you can say the Patriots and Titans. Thanks for having me. I appreciated my time in Nashville and Boston, but I'm going to go do something a little different because I think this is the best situation for me. And that's and what scares up, me. brought up a great point. Like, I don't even think it would be tampering because he's a free agent where it's like some of these teams could have just made calls to DeAndre and been like, I know you're taking visits with these teams, 
but like just hold out a little bit. Like the chief, like you said, the Chiefs could be like, we're going to restructure Chris Jones's deal. Let's see what kind of money we have. Yes, go take these visits. I'm sure they'll schmooze you. Hold out maybe like an extra month and just see what we can do with our cap. Maybe it won't be up to your standards. It won't be the paycheck. And then you go with your safety schools, the ones that have already accepted you. But there's a chance that you could come to Harvard. There's a chance that you could come to a big name if we're working these deals behind the scenes here. So I wonder if teams like that, even the Packers are like, we have no wide receivers and we have a almost. where they're trying to schmooze him and get him in there. I always wonder that stuff because I know there's a lot of parody and talk behind the scenes. There is a lot of talk. You know? be- yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. And these deals get done quickly. Oh. And that's what we're scares frozen. me. Oh, I'm frozen. Oh, boy. Can you hear me? But I have no doubt in my mind that they all, all teams do that. And I'm sure you. There we go. Nice. It, it wouldn't be a Tuck Will Takes episode if my internet didn't go out at least it once really every wouldn't. episode. It's I, a signature. I, I know. It, it just it has to happen. I don't know why it happens, but it does. But to your point, Liam, like, yes, these deals can get done, like, quickly, like, really quickly. And that's what scares me about this. I, I still believe that they should have gotten the deal done when he was in the building. And <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something. If he signs elsewhere, he will forever – be a Patriots villain of, as far as fans are concerned because of oh, yeah. the way that he approached the visit. Like he he's, you know, talking about everything's being great. He takes the picture with Judon in the locker room, puts it up on Instagram and everywhere else on social media. You can't do that knowing and how this sign. fan base is. And you can't do that and not sign. Of course. Like, yeah, if, yeah. If, if he kept it hush hush and everything, and he just, had just like his talk, Titans visit, just don't post anything about it. Don't, exactly. don't flirt with the idea. Right. Like if you just post like, okay, I'm in Nashville or I'm in Boston or I'm in Detroit or wherever. If you just post like that and then that's it for the rest of the visit, fine. But don't put the picture up in the on social media, in the locker room. Don't have Matt Judon tweeting out GM of the year question mark, you know, trolling the fans and everything. Because guess what? You can have fun with the fans. But we as fans take that very seriously because we want this team to be as good as possible. And when you're doing stuff like that, it just makes it worse. So I don't want this to continue to drag on for the rest of the summer, but it looks like that's what it's going to be until training camp. And that's unfortunate. But guess what? If you really want him, and if Bill Belichick wants a free agent, he goes and gets him. How many visits does Bill Belichick actually do? Not many. Very little. Yeah, we do not get free agents. So there's, there's the sign that Patriots are really interested. So if you're that interested... You fit all the boxes, both sides like what the other has to offer, get that deal done. I would be on the phone with DeAndre Hopkins every day being like, hey, when are you going to sign? Like, what is it going to take? Let's get this done. Yeah. They need to get it done. And if we hold so much stock, I just thought this, we hold so much stock in those three things that DeAndre Hopkins wanted as a team. On that same podcast, we also have to put a lot of stock in. They said, what quarterbacks would you like to play with? He named Jalen Hurts and Josh Allen and obviously Patrick Mahomes, all the studs. Mac Jones wasn't on that list. No, he wasn't. But then he then he went back and said, I can, you know, I can really play with any quarterback. Like, look at the quarterbacks I yeah, played with. 100%. He did say that. But also, like, that. that's kind of like a, a comment where it's like, as a player, there are things you shouldn't shouldn't say. So I can't help but think he was speaking his mind, and then he was like, oh, I, I, pro- "I probably shouldn't have said that." Or I just singled out like two thirds of the league because they don't have the an elite passer that throws it fifty times a game. Right. So let me let me just wheel it back. It's like, oh yeah, I, I played with T.J. Yates. Like I can do it with anyone. And you're like, yeah, you did. You played with Brock Osweiler. You played with Matt Schaub. You played with some – I actually like Matt Schaub. But you, you played, played with, with Colt McCoy. So. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you fre- played with that dude, uh, not F- Fred Savage, uh, something Savage, Tom Savage. And, like, you yeah, played yeah, with yeah. Ter- terrible quarterbacks. So it's like, yeah, you did do that. But wait, he, wait he played with Corey again. Matthews? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, fuck you. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but it's like, yeah, you did, but you don't want to do that again. And it, we know it. You know it. Like you're just walking back your statement now to be like, oh, like he doesn't want to go play with I don't know who's the worst quarterback and he doesn't like who, Justin Fields like he doesn't want to go play with a bad quarterback. No, he doesn't. So 
let me just say this, and then we can move on into next couple topics. I was looking at something on Twitter earlier. They had a side-by-side comparison of Mac Jones' first two years in the league and Josh Allen's first two years in the league. Yeah. Mac Jones actually had, like, more passing yards, pass per completion, pass per attempt. Uh, I think he had, like, right around the same interceptions. Like, there were a lot of stats that were comparable, if not better, than Josh Allen's in his first two years. Oh, yeah. And what was the difference to him for Josh Allen in year three? He had Stephon Diggs. Diggs. Yeah. Right. And who was Stephon Diggs deciding between, or who was it between for his services, the Bills and the Patriots? Yeah. So now if DeAndre Hopkins gets into the picture, I'm not saying he's going to be Stephon Diggs, but at least that's an elite receiver that Mac Jones has the option to throw to and potentially elevate his game to another level. Yeah. It, it's kind of the way of the league now where it's like you either get your – franchise quarterbacks, college uh, star wide receiver, or you get him an already established dynamic name receiver. That's been the way it's been since Joe Burrow kind of set that mold. And now it's, I mean, Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill as well, but I think it started with Joe Burrow and then they had so much success. And now it's like, you got to get that number one guy. Yeah, It's a passing league, steer into the skid and just give your young developing quarterback that safety blanket, that dynamic superstar receiver, if you feel that comfortably with your quarterback. It's a no-brainer. DeAndre Hopkins should be a Patriot because this is Mac Jones' prove-it year. Why not give him every chance in the world to prove that he is our quarterback? And that's mm-hmm. where us, us fans get pissed. We're like, just <clears throat> get the fucking guy. Speaking of uh, Patriots quarterbacks, that's a perfect segue into our next topic. Aaron Rodgers, the uh, yeah. quarterback for the uh, New York Jets, supposedly there was a rumor that the Patriots checked in. The Patriots checked in on Aaron Rodgers. And apparently Aaron Rodgers said no to a trade. Oh, now you're frozen. Oh. Hear me? Yep, got you. We're good. There we go. Okay. He he said no to a trade to the Patriots. Yes, Aaron Rodgers said no to a trade to the Patriots. I don't believe that. I don't buy that. I really don't buy the story. I, I think it's a crock. I, I the reason I'm saying this is because there was so much about Mac Jones going into year three and being the quarterback of the future. What I do believe is I think the Patriots might have just picked up the phone and just ca- kind of kicked the tires and been like hey, what's the deal with Aaron Rodgers? And maybe yeah. they're like, oh, we're, we're looking for this and this. And then maybe the Patriots are like, all right, no thanks. Thanks anyways. That's what yeah. I think happened. I don't think that like apparently Aaron Rodgers was like, oh no, I'm not going to play for you, Satan, or something like that to Bill Belichick. And it's like, wait a minute, Aaron Rodgers actually respects Bill Belichick a lot. So I just think it was a, a, a concocted story. I think Mike Lombardi even confirmed that it, it wasn't true. Like, I just, I think it was dumb. And it, just real quick, just opinion on that. I just, I, this is like a, a, okay, cool. Let's move on type of thing. I, I don't think they probably even inquired, but if they did, I would agree. Like you said, it would be an open and shot case where they are like, all right, I'm just curious. What do you want? And then when they saw the haul that it probably was, I don't even remember what the jets gave up. Was it first round picks or I think so. I'd have to go I, back. I know it, it was a de- decent chunk of stuff. I didn't think it was egregious by any means. But for Bill Belichick, like, at this point, I don't know how much faith he has in Mac Jones. I like to think it's a lot. Uh, I just don't see any any benefit to having Aaron Rodgers. Like, even if he balls out this year, balls out next year, like, why would we kind of ruin everything that we built for an old quarterback? Uh, it never made much sense to me. So I don't think they inquired. A lot of that stuff just seems to be, and me and Mike love to harp on it, it's fun to hate Bill Belichick. Like, it's so easy. He doesn't give you anything. He right. He's mean to the media. Like, he doesn't seem like a fun dude. Like, the Patriots don't seem like a fun organization because they don't say anything. They're not like the Chiefs where Travis Kelsey's yelling, like, You got to fight for your right to party. Yeah, and then he said something about Joe Burrow, too, like Burrowhead or something like that. or I don't don't even remember. But they don't have any, like, uproarious people flipping out or showing overtly that they have fun. This is a job. We're a professional organization. People don't like that because it it is a sport. It's a game in the end, and they want to see the players having fun. 
fun doesn't get you six Super Bowls. It'll it get you not. a couple. It'll be fun, but like this is an this is the army as much as it is a game. Like you are regimented. You will show up on time. If you're not 15 minutes early, then you're 15 minutes late type deal. That's how this works. It's fun to hate on the organization that had a lot of success. So I think most of the stuff that we've heard the last couple of years since Tom Brady left has been, oh, shame Bill Belichick, blah, blah, blah. Like, look what Tom Brady did. Now he's living his best life. There always has to be a winner and a loser. The first thing that you hear after somebody makes a trade, who's the winner and loser of this trade? There's mm-hmm. not always a winner and loser. Sometimes everyone loses. Sometimes everyone wins. So it's just, I think it's a product of the social media age where there always has to be somebody that's the loser, the downtrodden one of every circumstance. There can't just be a mutual, can't just be a situation. It can't be. And again, I, I, I'm i not going to put too much more into this. Like it, yeah. it was, it, like you said, open and shut case. Maybe it just it seems like a headline fun. grab. It is. That's all it is, especially in an off season where, there wasn't a lot going on until like, obviously like the Jack Jones situation and Deandre Hopkins and stuff like that. But again, like, okay, Aaron Rodgers, go enjoy your couple of years with the jets. Then the jets will go back to probably being irrelevant. And then they're going to end up being the little brother again to the Patriots where it's two automatic wins as opposed to maybe one. So we've read this book. We have. So, all right. You brought, you wanted to bring up this topic. So I'll kind of let you lead the conversation with this, but I know you want to talk about some OTA stuff, so I'll let you kind of take the uh, bull by the horns here. Totally. So OTAs isn't sexy. Like training camp isn't sexy. It's not stuff that gets a lot of headlines or whatnot. There's no pads, like very little contact. There's no real performance. I think all the the nitty gritty, the really dictating players' skills and whatnot, when we were talking about how good Christian Gonzalez is doing in training camp, Yes, it's cool to see, but if he picked off every single pass in training camp, that still doesn't mean he's going to be good in the games. Like I like to see it in the preseason, but it's still fun to see players develop and see players have big plays. We talked about how Malik Cunningham had a diving one-handed catch, and it's like, oh, my God, he's a quarterback. Like That's cool. So I still want to give it some attention. I don't want to get too hyped about it, but I don't want to get underhyped about it either, where it's I'm like, oh, none of this means anything, because it does. It just shows that they have ability and that they have an innate sense of football. So I wanted to ask, from what you've heard, from what you've seen, I know you're very involved with Patriots, everything, really, but there's always, every day, there's a big report after each training camp, after each OTA, discussing plays that happen and whatnot. I wanted to know what are three players that you think have surprised you or just been still very solid as you expected three players that kind of stand out to you through training camp and so far into OTAs that you like and expect to have a big role this upcoming season. And you're, and we're doing just a positive light, right? No negative light, just only positive. No negative. Yeah. Yeah. This is a positive podcast here. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's really positive. Yeah. Uh, Like, 25% 25% of the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. So the first guy, we, we talked about him a little bit in the Jack Jones segment. Christian Gonzalez has been someone that a lot of, even the yeah. veterans are are happy with. That, yeah, they that's see, a layup. Yeah. They see the athleticism. They see the speed. They see, they, they see the versatility. They just, he looks the part and he does it so smoothly. So I think that's going to translate onto the field. So Christian Gonzalez is my first one. Do you want to go back and forth or do you want to just go all three? Uh, let's go all three. Okay. But Patri- Patriots media media plays into it too, big time. Like he had that one handed catch on the first day of training camp, and everyone's like, "Oh my god, the first round pick!" And it's like, "Yes, it's cool. Uh, okay. I I like that he can catch the ball." But they're, they're totally feeding into it too, where every first round pick gets the most attention, but him specifically is getting a lot of attention. Yes, I'll go with a, a player on offense now. Someone that's been getting a little bit of attention and should have gotten more attention last year, Kendrick Bourne. He's yep. he's someone that Mac Jones has been going to early and often in training camp. I kind of he, figured you'd go this way. <laughs> I, well, I was thinking Mac, but I'm like, you know what? I, I got to change it up. I can't make it too obvious. But I think Kendrick Bourne's going to have a big part in this offense. I really do. Because I think that he showed last year in very small dosages, like the Cincinnati game last year, he was the reason the Patriots were even in that game. Yep. Yeah, he did play well. And when he had his limited opportunities last year, he made the most of it. Why he wasn't in there more, I don't know. And then the last person I'm going to choose, I'm going to stick on the offensive side of the ball 
But I'm going to go with the coach. I'm going with Bill O'Brien. Because guess what? Everyone has been saying, it. everyone's been saying Bill O'Brien has brought just that level of just familiarity, that comfort, and everything else. Now, granted, he has the nickname. You know what his nickname is? No. Teapot. Because he can cool. blow his, he can blow his, blow uh, up really Blow his quickly. top. Yep, blow his top really quickly. And right now, it's all like, you know, they're they're singing Kumbaya by the fire. Like, it's, it's all good yeah, it's right all now. it's all sunshine and rainbows. But the big thing is, and even Mac Jones said it, everyone's on the same page. There's a, there's a comfort. There's a relaxation of just like things are normal. Because it wasn't normal last year. No. But now we see that when you bring in someone that knows what they're doing, a la Josh McDaniels when he was here in 2021, good things are going to happen. Oh, yeah. I have heard that, too. Bill O'Brien does seem like he just kind of came in, and he's already been a part of this Patriots organization. He's already been through these exact motions with this exact organization. Mm -hmm. So it seems like he just came in, took it in stride, and really – captivated everyone they're all like all right this dude means business and that's what we need i hope he fucking blows his top and flips out of this team because <laughs> i can't stand another season of watching receivers and an offense like we had last season if no one can create separation i hope bill o'brien brings all the wide receivers to the side and goes what the fuck have you learned up until this point if right. you cannot run the route tree and get open what use are you I don't care about your speed. I don't care about your hands. Get open. Don't. I don't want to have to rely on 50-50 balls every play. Anquan Bolden was the slowest receiver I have ever seen in my life. Motherfucker should have won Super Bowl MVP, and he was an exceptional receiver because all he did was get open. Doesn't matter about your hands. If you're wide open, you're probably going to catch it anyway. Just get open. And that's the kind of coach I want. Coach that knows what he's doing, a coach that's going to push his players to be the yeah. best that they can be. Coach that just knows what he's doing. Yeah, because Bill Bill Belichick doesn't seem like the type to me that flips out. Like, I feel like he's the law. Like he's cold. You know, police officers don't flip out at you; they slap you with a charge, and then the real punishment is jail time or fines or whatever it gets. Bill Belichick seems like he's the law, where he's not going to cuss you up and down for being terrible. You need somebody that gets in your face and flips out. And that's going to be Bill O'Brien. And and there have been a lot of reports, too, that Bill O'Brien has, is basically the head coach of the offense. It's kind of yeah. like, okay, it's O'Brien's offense. Belichick's being hands-off with it. He's focusing on the defense. He's focusing on the special teams, which is exactly what you want. Let Bill O'Brien yeah. do his thing. Let him take back this offense and let him do what they – let him do with this offense what they need to do to get back into the top half of the league. They don't have to be top 10. Just be yeah. top half of the league and be, you know, just formidable at best. Mm. All right, so now, Liam, your three. First of all, and I'm not crazy about this player. I wasn't crazy about him last year. Uh, he had almost no role. One touchdown and gone. Ty Montgomery. It seen, I hear yeah. a lot of him play. They have him at wide receiver. He's catching every pass that's thrown his way. They're still using him as a running back, but it seems like it's mostly wide receiver. A lot of big talk comes out about Ty Montgomery. I like the sound of it. If we have another, we don't exactly need another wide receiver, but hell, if he can come out of the backfield and catch passes, he was drafted as a wide receiver. Mm -hmm. So I like what I'm hearing about him. Just another versatility with the Patriots where it's like he can play running back, he can play wide receiver. You'll figure it out on Sunday when you have to guard him. And I love that. I do like so, the Ty, Mon I, I like the Ty Montgomery pick. People forget he scored the first touchdown last year for the Patriots yeah. before he got hurt for the year. And I think he's going to be what James Robinson was going to be if yeah. he was going to stick around. And I think he's going to be kind of the nice compliment to Ramondre Stevenson. Definitely. Take take some load off him because he got hurt last year. We had Pierre Strong mm -hmm. toward the end. You can't run a running back like we did with Ramondre multiple seasons he's going to be gone after next season if we keep doing that to him. So right. it's like you need to break it up. I it just seems like such an unsexy name to me. Like Ty Montgomery has been a journeyman forever. He's never been particularly great in any area. And I'm not expecting big numbers with the Patriots, but you know, like three receiving touchdowns and two rushing touchdowns, that, that'd be fine for me. That's a versatile season. And it's another weapon. So when I hear all this in training camp, I'm like, Oh yeah, we do have Ty Montgomery. 
cool. It's just it, it's a, another dagger. It is. It is another element to the offense that's going to be good, and another element of the offense that's going to be unique, which is what they yeah. need. All right, player number two, Mac Jones, and I'm glad you didn't say him because. I, I specifically, I, I've gone out on this show, gone out on a limb for him. I have said, Max, my guy. I believe in him. I'm a huge fan. I love his arm to talent. I like him as a person and as a quarterback. You have to have the personality for it. I believe he does. Last season, it was brutal. It was tough to watch him. A quarterback that I like in an organization that I like really make a lot of strange, sketchy decisions around him, bringing him into the bears game, setting him up to fail in a sense. And then Mm -hmm. it just sowed seeds of doubt for our franchise quarterback. Now half the people want to bench for Bailey Zappi. So when he goes out there and goes 12 of 12 in seven on sevens and it's flawless, I love to see that the day before he did throw two picks, but Bailey Zappi wasn't much better throwing one pick and completing less passes that just tells me the defense was on it that day. All court mm-hmm. Trace McSorley isn't even a thought in my mind. I barely look at Trace McSorley's numbers. I love the song. I like the story. He seems like a cool dude. He's not going to be our quarterback. And if he is, season's probably fucking over. So I'm only looking at Bailey Zappi and Mac Jones. Ho- kind of looking to be like, is Bailey Zappi out playing Mac Jones? And he's not. It's really not close. Everyone's saying Mac is the guy and Mac's performing unbelievably well. It's seven on seven. So you're playing against air. There's no pressure. But if you're throwing perfect in a seven on seven session, that's exactly what you want to see. You're not floating any passes. People question his arm strength. I can't question his arm strength if he's putting the ball on the money and delivering it on air. Mac is QB1. Plain and simple. He's He's QB1. He's in a functional offense now. He can break down a play at the line of scrimmage. He can kind of look at the defense, see what the holes are in it. And with Bill O'Brien now in his ear, it's going to be even better. So, yes, I love the Mac Jones pick. And, again, we've said it so many times in this podcast, and we're going to keep saying it. If he succeeds, we roll with him for the future. If he doesn't succeed, we talk about, okay, what can we do to replace him or what's the next step if he can't figure it out, which is fair if he has – Two out of three bad seasons, but I don't think he's going to have a bad season this year. I, I don't think, think he's so. And if he does, we'll be humble people. about it. We'll say, hey, we were wrong. We totally thought he was going to be good, and he wasn't. And we'll take it in stride. But at, you saw, everyone saw, and everyone was making fun of him for it, the Will Levis video where he throws it, like, way over the target. Do you know what I'm talking about? The quarterbacks do, yeah. are throwing into nets, and Will Levis gets up and just completely misses the net. Doesn't get anywhere close to it. And anyone who's played football, played quarterback, me, the three-time beach football champion the last year's running, I've thrown plenty of passes in a row. It's tough to constantly put it on the money each time. And if Will Levis, who was going to be a top pick, people question his talent. If he's just soaring passes sometimes, it kind of happens to almost all quarterbacks where some passes are going to get away from you. But if Mac Jones just seems to be pretty much on the money, basically all the time and no videos have come out like the will levis one because people are looking to hate on mac jones if he throws a bad pass people are going to be all over it bailey zappi would never do that i haven't seen any videos like that of mac just soaring passes on wide open receivers or on targets or anything like that and to me that's a golden sign will levis was even projected to be a number one pick at, at, it was, which at some is just, point. it's all a smoke screen. Like that, mm. yeah, I feel bad for the dude because that was just other teams trying to get them to take him so they could get their guy and trying to get the Titan or some of the top teams to waste a pick. I really do feel bad for him because I don't I think like, most people actually thought he was a top five pick. Most people were like, he does not have that talent. And no. then the poor, poor dude showed up on day one, just sat there like an idiot. <laughs> And another reason why I think the Titans, and going back to Hopkins real quick, I think that's another reason why the Titans just doesn't seem appealing to me. Got three quarterbacks trying to bail it out and and everything else. But again, I digress. All right, last guy. The last guy, the coup de gras. And I've I've been talking about him almost as much as I've been talking about Kayshawn Booty. I kind of wanted to mention him here, but he hasn't made many spectacular plays, and he's been in and out of the lineup. I did see Kayshawn Booty – doing some like cut drills and whatnot. He looks fine. looks like he put on some muscle, but I'm thinking about the opposite end of the ball. I'm thinking about Marte Mapu and the fact that they have him all over the place. They have him at 
corner, safety, linebacker. They're just trying him out anywhere and everywhere. And for a guy that everyone said he's a linebacker, he, he can't play deep safety. They're going to try him there, and they're going to see what he's good at for deep safety. And just like Cliff Kingsbury said, nothing is similar with the Patriots week to week. So some weeks we will see him close to the line of scrimmage, playing that strong safety Troy Polamalu role where he's floating around trying to get the picks. And then other times we'll have him deep, covering guys over the top, just trying to take away the big plays. I'm just interested to see how this premier stellar athlete works in the most versatile defense I might have ever seen ever. Like I've never seen a team that carries four safeties and all this wild shit that the Patriots are doing. So when they draft a guy this high where people weren't expecting it at a surplus position, I'm like, they're going to use them, but how? And then I see in training camp and OTAs that they're moving them all over the place. And I'm like, okay, gives me a little hope if, Peppers gets hurt or Duggar gets hurt and whatnot. This dude, hell, our linebackers get hurt. We lose, you know, uh, Tavai or whoever we'll have out there, Bentley. You could possibly slot this guy in there. Our biggest problem, too, was crossing routes against the Bills and whatnot. I certainly think this guy can help in that area. He's got some killer speed and closing ability. I like it. I like it a lot. It's a pick that when it happened, I was like, what the fuck's up with this? And now that I see him in action, see how they're using him, it it tickles my fancy. It feels like a lightning bolt that's hit the tip of my penis. I'm intrigued by what he is going to do for this team. Nice Step Brothers reference, by the way. Mm, uh, can't go wrong. You, ne- you can't. My favorite It literally movie. fits every situation. Oh, favorite movie of all time. That's my yeah. favorite. Oh, yeah. But Marte Mapu, a versatile guy a Belichick guy, a Patriots guy. He's going to fit into this defense. He's going to do a lot of different things. And that's what Bill Belichick likes. Smart, versatile athletes. Oh, yeah. So Yeah, it does seem like a match made in heaven. It really does. So just to kind of recap, three guys I took, excuse me, I took Bill O'Brien, I took Kendrick Bourne, and I took Christian Gonzalez. Liam took Marte Mapu, excuse me, Mac Jones, and Ty Montgomery. Yep. Weird ones. And I was trying to kind of go off the beaten path there. Besides Mac Jones, I was just trying to pick kind of obscure guys because it, it, it's Parsons. easy to, to point at like the studs on our team. Like, yes, Judon's getting a ton of pressures. There's The blocking is probably not up to par, but he's still killing it as always. And our studs, Kyle Duggar, balling out. But that's what I expect because he's a motherfucker. Kyle Duggar is, is a baller. He, he's turning yeah. into a defensive star right before our very eyes. And I, I love it. Every I love it. All right. Final topic of the night before we get out for the week. A couple running backs that are on the free agent market. Dalvin Cook, obviously a free agent after being released from the Minnesota Vikings. Ezekiel Elliott is still on the free agency market. I'm just going to keep this nice and quick, Liam. Dalvin Cook said he'd like to team up with DeAndre Hopkins. And Jeremy Fowler, ESPN's Jeremy Fowler, came out and said the Patriots, you know, could maybe make a call. You know, it's nice to dream. I don't know what's going to happen, but simple question. Do you think the Patriots, A, could use one of Dalvin Cook or Ezekiel Elliott? And B, if they could use one of them, which one do you see as more likely of a fit as to who would be the more plausible, not not plausible, but more the realistic signing in this case, if you had to choose between the two? Well, I'll start with the last question. Dalvin Cook's a pipe dream. Like, yeah. I, I, I love the idea, obviously. I think he's a stud. Uh, I I don't know if there's a bit of fall off there, and maybe that's why the Vikings are so quick to get rid of him. I I tend to go with the organization where it's like, if this guy's leaving, there's usually a reason for it. Like, even with DeAndre Hopkins leaving the Cardinals, it's like, they're probably going to be rebuilding, and he's probably only got a good year or two in him. In theory, maybe he'll prove me wrong. So I'm like, what's the deal with Dalvin Cook? Either way, he's a star name. He'll put asses in seats, and it'll be entertaining to watch him. But I just... For the money, I don't think it'd be realistic. It would be awesome the, to get one of the best wide receivers in the league and one of the best running backs. Obviously, it's fun to talk about. It pole vaults us into a different tier. People think of the Patriots differently if we have DeAndre Hopkins and Dalvin Cook because a shitty offense last year, before you even see it on the field, now has two studs, and that changes everyone's perception. So it's fun to talk about but I can't exactly imagine it happening. I can't either. And I'm glad you said that. Like, it, it's fun to dream. Like, I think Ezekiel Elliott would be more of the realistic signing because I think he would yeah. be a one-year deal on short money. But I don't think either of those guys are going to end up here. 
But I do think that the Patriots are all set at running back. I mean, Ramondre's Ramondre. He's a guy that can break tackles and a guy that has good breakaway speed. And Ty Montgomery. Right. And Ty Montgomery can be your, you know, inside the five yard line, a guy that barrels into the end zone too. So you have both running backs in place. And then Kevin Harris and Pierre Strong were good in their limited time last year as rookies. And they'll probably look to take a second year jump. You have plenty of running back to, and JJ Taylor. You can have JJ yeah. Taylor come in and, you know, play a little bit of running back too when he's not on special teams. So the running back room is fine. I like the running back room as is. That's what I thought too. But I would have said the same thing about our safeties before we drafted Marte. And like, I would say the same thing about our corners before we re-signed Jalen Mills and all that stuff. Like the Patriots seem to just stack talent at positions that they don't exactly need. I do think Zeke, I can't believe I'm saying this. I do. I, I think Zeke would probably be the better player and the more realistic option for the Patriots, which is fucking ludicrous. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen either. I think he's probably going to go back to Dallas on a cheap deal or probably go to the Eagles for a ridiculous sum of money and rob them. Uh, But I think Ezekiel Elliott would be the perfect change of pace back for Ramondre Stevenson, where it's like, yes, Ty Montgomery can get in there for a handful of plays, third down, third and longs and whatnot, and even give you a receiving threat in the end zone. But you can – Use Zeke on the five yard line, get him, you know, five touchdowns, seven touchdowns, just giving it to him on the goal line. He's fat. He's still good at rolling into the end zone. And it just takes more wear and tear off Ramondre. If you could get Zeke for like the veterans minimum, like obviously, I think that would be a great deal. Um, if I were to bet, I don't think either one of them would come to the Patriots, but I, I do see Zeke as the better fit. Yeah. Okay. Any other final thoughts, Liam? Just Patriots thoughts before we kind of head out for the week. Pretty much, uh, pretty much said it all right there. I think I think that's a wrap on on my thoughts. <clears throat> all right. So just to kind of recap everything, if you just want a uh, simple thirty second recap of the episode, Jack Jones not looking good legally. Nope, loves guns though. Big gun guy. Yeah, huge it's gun news guy. To me, DeAndre Hopkins needs to sign here soon. Aaron Rodgers will never come here. And that's okay. We're Patriots, at peace with it. We are at peace with it. Patriots OTAs over and done with. And we have some guys that we really like. And the running back room's good as it is. But if we wanted to bring someone in, maybe take a look at uh, Ezekiel Elliott. Yeah. And if they got Dalvin Cook and DeAndre Hopkins, I would be insufferable. Mike would be unbearable to listen to and you would just be a little more hyped than you usually are but it right. would it would it would propel the patriots to new heights not likely though fun to not, think about. It, it like you said it's a pipe dream but it's a fun pipe dream mm-hmm. <clears throat> as always make sure to rate and subscribe to the tuck rule takes podcast everywhere where you can get your podcast itunes spotify soundcloud anchor follow us on instagram at tuck rule takes Follow us on Twitter at Tuck Rule Takes as well. Mike, once again, we missed you, bud. And we'll have hopefully the whole crew back next week. But for episode 87, the Ben Coates episode. Fuck yeah. We out. Sweet feet. Sign DeAndre Hopkins, please. <laughs>